God bless you, everybody. Welcome to church. Happy Sunday. Uh, everybody just stand up and join me in prayer. God, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this, this time that we get to spend with you. Thank you for giving us uh, an opportunity to worship you together in fellowship, to worship you with friends and with family, Lord. I ask that you just fill every house church with your spirit, God. That there be an overwhelming sense of joy and gratitude. God, I can't wait to hear about uh, all the things that you are going to do in house church today. In your name we pray. Amen. We await the promise to come 
Everything that you have spoken will come to pass. Let it be done.
I searched the world It couldn't feel me Man's empty praise Treasures that fade I'm never enough And you came along And put me back together is now satisfied hearing your love there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you there's nothing nothing is better than you
Not a single thing in this world could ever compare. Not a single thing in this world could ever come close. There is nothing that this world could offer us. There is nothing that, that our families, that our friends, that our jobs, that our hobbies, there is nothing out there that can compare to you, God. You are every bit of our satisfaction. You are every bit of fulfillment for us, God. Just a taste of your spirit and your presence and your love is enough to sustain us for the rest of our lives. God, thank you for being Jehovah Jireh, being our satisfaction, filling every single one of our needs. Thank you, God. I say you just fill the rest of this time, the rest of this service with an overwhelming sense of gratitude, an overwhelming sense of joy and fulfillment, knowing that our Father is all that we will ever need. Amen. Well, we're going to come to the Lord's table today in remembering what Christ has done for us at Communion. So just take a moment, if you will, if your house church is having communion today and you want to stop the video and uh, prepare, go ahead and do that. Uh, but um, we're just going to read the scripture today and pray together, and then we'll let you respond in the way that you want to in each individual house church. Stephanie. The scripture is 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 32. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number, a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for uh, just the words of the scripture. Uh, repentance is a gift from you, and I want to thank you so much that you give us an opportunity to align our hearts with you. You say clearly that if we examine our own hearts, if we discern what's happening in our own lives, and we realign our hearts with you, that we will not come under judgment. I think of 1 John where it says, if any of you has sinned, that uh, if we repent, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So Lord, you are so gracious and loving with us, and we just give you praise and honor and glory. But Lord, we do take a moment today just to examine our hearts. Lord, if we have sinned against people in our life, if we have committed sins of the thought life, if we have omitted things, perhaps things that we should have done that we did not, passivity itself when you've called us to be active is a sin. So Lord, we just take a moment to allow you to search our hearts and uh, we pray, Lord, that you would bring things to mind. But Lord, we do repent and we do align our hearts with you. We thank you for all the Lord Jesus has done for us. We thank you for his body broken for us. We thank you for his blood shed for us. And we also pray, Lord, if there's any sick among us today, we know that uh, Isaiah 53 said that uh, by his stripes, by his wounds, we have been healed. And we ask, Lord, that you would bring healing and blessing and uh, just full restoration of health in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Welcome to River of Life Community Church. Whether you're joining us online or as a part of our house church gathering, we hope you enjoy your time with us and experience God's presence. Our next live all church celebration service will be Sunday, February 5th at 10 a.m. here at the River of Life Church building. Everyone is welcome. If you are interested in ROL membership, have attended the Freedom class, on-ramp class, and been at ROL for at least six months, contact the office for an application. We will be accepting new members on February 5th. Completed applications must be returned to the church office no later than January 30th. Greg Heidi will be hosting a cornhole tournament for anyone ages 12 and up on Saturday, February 4th that will begin at noon. Chili will be provided, but feel free to bring any other snacks or desserts you would like. If you are interested in attending, please call or text Greg Heidi for more details or to RSVP at 330-808-0766. We are working on updating our River of Life church directory. If you are new to River of Life, have moved recently, or are unsure if you have your correct information and would like to be included in the new directory, please contact us or let your house church leader know. We would like to include a photo with your information so people can place names with faces. If you don't already have one or would like a new one taken, you can email one to the church or we can take one after service when you are at the building. Thank you for your continued giving to River of Life. We pray that God will richly bless you for your generosity and faithfulness. Gifts can be dropped off, mailed to the church at P.O. Box 2130 or given directly on our website or app. Our prayer team is always available. If you would like to have someone pray with you, leave us a message on our website, contact form, or call us at 330-342-9796. Well, that's what's happening this week. Let's prepare our hearts for the word. Herding cats. Don't let anybody tell you it's easy. Anybody can herd cattle. Holding together 10,000 half wild short hairs. Well, that's another thing altogether. You see the movies, you, you hear the stories, it's... I'm living a dream. Not everyone can do what we do. It ain't an easy job, but when you bring a herd into town and you ain't lost a one of them, ain't a feeling like it in the world. Hello, little friends. Welcome to church. We are so happy to be with you. This month's memory verse is Proverbs 37, verse 5. Are you ready? Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust Him, and He will help you. Great job! All right, get ready to listen. We have finished our section, My Heart Garden. Today, we are starting a new section called Hearing God's Voice Through Scripture. We know that God speaks through many things, like gut feelings, called intuition or discernment, through miracles and signs, through the people around us, and through prayer and worship. All throughout the Bible, God's loving voice can be seen, calling us into a deeper relationship with Him and teaching us the truth about the beautiful and complex world He created for us. Our lesson for today is hearing God's voice in worship. When we talk about worship, usually you think about singing and playing music during a church service, but worship is much more than just the music that we offer to the Lord during church. Worship is a way to interact with God, to acknowledge, to honor, and to adore Him in everything we're doing. That's what I want you to remember most from today. In Colossians 3.23, the Bible tells us, Whatever you do, do it from the heart, as something done for the Lord and not for people. And in Romans 12.1, to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. These verses teach us to live our lives as if, as if every single thing we do is being done to please the Lord. So imagine you're playing soccer. Play like you're playing for God's team. You're baking cookies? Bake as if you are baking cookies for God to enjoy. You're obeying your parents by cleaning your room? Clean as if God is going to be a guest staying in your room. Do everything you do with God in your mind and in your heart. For your sharing activity today, think of your favorite thing to do. Draw a picture of you doing your favorite thing with the Lord. Take time to think about what you'll share with your groups during discussion time. Encourage your friends to do the same. Okay, kiddos, make good decisions today, be brave, and don't be afraid to ask hard questions or for help if you need it. Good morning, River of Life family. Uh, it's good to be back with you and uh, wanted to 
Uh, share a couple things before we get into the Word today. First of all, a number of you have asked for more copies of Letter to the American Church. We'll keep these in stock as long as they keep flying off the shelf. Uh, if you haven't read this, this is a powerful uh, Word to the American Church about our posture in speaking out about truth in the midst of a very dark society, and uh, I think it's well done. Another book that we uh, are starting, and I'll be uh, studying this with a couple people, just uh, people I'm doing a one-on-one -on -one study with. This is uh, Scribes in Scripture uh, by John Mead and Peter Gurry. Uh, this is a story of what our Bible is, how we got our Bible from beginning to end. Uh, it starts with the evidence of the manuscripts and all the thousands of manuscripts that we have. It talks about how the Bible was translated, how it was transmitted through the ages, and uh, how the different translations compare with one another. So it's a great modern approach uh, to uh, what uh, how we got our Bible. Well, this morning we're going to be talking about a kingdom of priests, and uh, this is part of the Lord's Prayer, Thy Kingdom Come, Thy Will Be Done. Thanks to Dion last week, a very powerful word about putting uh, the kingdom of God first. And of course, when we align our hearts first with the kingdom, he says everything else is added to us. Well, let's pray. Father, just open our hearts and minds to receive from your word. Uh, I feel like, like you have a powerful word for us today. Give us uh, the ability to hear everything that you're saying. But more than that, let your word have full effect in our heart and in our spirit. Let it renew our minds, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There's so much to say about the kingdom of God. We could probably go on for years about that. Obviously, we're just hitting some of the uh, key dimensions about the kingdom of God and uh, why Jesus has us pray, thy kingdom come. Just a quick review. We've talked about God's kingdom coming in power and fullness at the end of time. So we know there's going to be a full consummation of the kingdom when the Lord returns. Uh, we've also talked about living in the intersection of two kingdoms, how we have uh, two kingdoms colliding, the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of this world and, and how we're supposed to live. Dion challenged us last week about putting the kingdom first in our lives. And uh, when the kingdom of God is not first in our life, everything else is out of alignment. Uh, when we're seeking his kingdom first, everything will fall into place. Today, I want to talk a little bit more about our identity uh, as the people of God. Now, we all have a calling. We all have a, uh, an identity in the Lord. It's uh, what he has called us to do. Uh, today, I'm talking more about who we are as the people of God rather than we're, what we're called to do. But there are obedience points. There are things that he has called us to do as his people. 1 Peter 2, uh, starting in verse 4, it says, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, the stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders has rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But listen to verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. You may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And then he says, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and aliens to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So look what he calls us here in verse 9. He says, you are a chosen people. Scripture tells us that many are chosen, or many are called, but few are chosen. And uh, when he says we're a chosen people, that means that God from the beginning of time, before we were uh, even created, before we were formed in our mother's womb, uh, the Lord had a plan for us. He chose us. 
He has called us to be a royal priesthood. Uh, and you might say, I never saw myself as a priest. Uh, this is the universal priesthood that the Reformers talked about in the Protestant Reformation. They began to discover that it wasn't just a select class of people that were called to be priests and to be set apart to the Lord, but the entire uh, body of Christ, the entire church were designed to be a holy priesthood. Then he says, you're a holy nation. Out of all the peoples of the earth, God desires one people that belong to him, a holy nation. Back in uh, the Old Testament, uh, that was Israel. They were the holy nation. And here the Lord is saying, I'm going to take people from every nation, tribe, language, and people that you may be my special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And if I could tell you the one main thing as priests, the one duty that we are called to uh, do and be part of, that is declaring the praises of him who called us out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Now, before God spoke this word about being a chosen people and a royal priesthood, he said the same thing to Israel in Exodus. As a matter of fact, almost uh, word for word in Exodus 19.5, uh, here he's speaking to Moses as he's giving the law to the people. He said, now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine. And notice what the Lord says there. He's telling Israel, you're a special group of people to me. You have a special purpose, but all of the earth is mine. All the nations belong to me. This is something that Israel, when they were not in alignment with God's heart, forgot. They forgot their role to be a witness to all the other nations. Uh, so much so that when Jesus was on earth and he visited the temple, he went to where the money changers were and the money changers had set up their tables in the court of the Gentiles. It was the place where the nations were supposed to come and seek after God. They had totally displaced that function. They had, because they had set up their tables there, uh, they had uh, kept the Gentiles and all the nations that came to seek Yahweh out. And that's why the Lord was so vehement in cleansing the temple and telling those people, get out of the way. You've made, you've made this place that was designed for prayer uh, basically an unclean, unholy place. In verse 6 of Exodus 9, he goes on, he said, and he's saying this to Israel, You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So God's design is that Israel was going to be a special nation to him. Not exclusive because he wanted all the nations to belong to him. He wanted all the nations to hear uh, the truth that he wanted to present to the world. God's desire from the beginning of time has not changed. He wants a company of people who will love him, who will obey him, who will look like him. Any good father wants his children to uh, look like him and prosper and uh, to carry on uh, the work that he has for them. So God worked through his people Israel and uh, when they were aligned with the heart of the Lord, uh, they brought forth good fruit and they were a witness to all the nations. The fear of the Lord fell on all the nations around Israel from Egypt to Babylon to Assyria and you see that in scripture. When they turned to idolatry, actually things went the other way and the Lord allowed them to be invaded. And this is a word to us as a nation. If we honor the Lord, he will use us as a blessing nation to give to other nations. If we turn away from the Lord, uh, we will bring uh, judgment and we will bring uh, literally invasion uh, from other nations. And that's pretty clearly established throughout scripture uh, in the Old Testament. So during the time of Jesus, a remnant of the people of Israel accepted Jesus as Messiah and they became part of that new holy nation. But the Lord from the very beginning, he says, from Jerusalem to the uttermost parts of the earth, I want this gospel to go forth and he wants a nation of priests. Now, as we talk about being a priest, uh, you don't have to get a little cassock and a collar and uh, all that stuff. You don't have to give up your marriage if you're married. Uh, please don't panic. That's not the kind of priest we're talking about. But I want to talk about five dimensions of our identity as the people of God. And we're just going to start this today. Again, the Lord has cautioned me, don't rush through this because this is an important thing that he wants us to get in this season. 
There are five dimensions of our identity as the people of the kingdom of God, being that kingdom of priests. Number one, we are presence of God bearers. We bear the presence of God. Literally, we carry his glory in jars of clay. I'll put the other five up there, but we're just going to focus on that number one today. So in 1 Peter 2, 9 through 12, that declaration uh, that we are to be a kingdom of priests, we are to bring the presence of God wherever you go. Did you ever think of yourself as a presence bearer? Did you ever think of yourself as a, as uh, one scripture says, we are jars of clay that are filled with God's glory? Wherever we go, we bring praise to God. Wherever we go, we bring the presence of God. When we are obedient to this scripture as a kingdom of priests and we lift up praises to God, we bring the Lord's presence down in that place, in that time, in that moment. And uh, we are literally bringing God's presence to that place in a very dark place, in a very dark world that we live in where a lot of people don't worship God, where a lot of people worship false gods. They say they don't have any gods, but everybody has a God. And uh, there we are worshiping the Lord and God's presence comes down. I'll ask you uh, this morning later, how many of you have had that experience where you've gone into a business or you've gone into a family situation or you've gone into a social situation and all of a sudden there was that presence of the Lord that was there and maybe you were worshiping the Lord uh, inside. I remember this happening on a, on a bus that I was on one time and I was just worshiping the Lord quietly and all of a sudden God's joy broke out and I looked at other people and they were smiling at me. I, I think there was a release of the presence uh, in that moment. Now, this is something that's lost on many evangelicals. As a matter of fact, a good portion of Western evangelicalism, uh, it tends toward evangelical rationalism. It's this idea that it's about the Word of God only. Uh, We need to know the Word well. We need to study the Word. But if you talk to people about God's presence, they have no concept what we're talking about. They talk about a song service where we sing songs to the Lord, but there's no real awareness of the presence of the Lord. I want to be part of a church where when people walk in to our gatherings, they know that God is in our midst. I want my house to be the kind of place that when people walk into my house, they say, what is it about your house? There's just so much peace here, or we sense the presence of God. As presence bearers, we need to make a difference wherever we go. And uh, we uh, see in, in the church in Acts, this dynamic presence of God in Acts 4, as they had that prayer meeting, it says they felt like the place was shaken uh, that they were in. In other t- places, uh, the power of God just comes down and they know the Lord is there. There's such a tangible presence that by the time they leave that gathering, no one can doubt that they have been in the presence of God. That's one of the things I pray, by the way, about every one of our services, is that by the time people leave, it's not just about the Word. It's not just about getting a good sermon. It's not just about fellowship, but that people will know that they have been in the presence of God. A mighty man of God went home to be uh, with the Lord here in the last couple weeks, Jack Hayford. Uh, Some of you might know uh, Jack, I believe he was 88 years old. Um, He uh, started out, I guess, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I I wrote down some notes from Christianity Today about him. If you know anything about Jack Hayford, he wrote over 500 hymns and worship choruses uh, in his life. He was a man of praise. And he really believed that whatever he did, that it was all about God's presence, all about God's praise. This is a big part of the Messenger Fellowship that we have been part of. Uh, Steve Fry and uh, his dad, Jerry, grew up uh, with Jack in California. They were part of that same network of pastors on the West Coast. And this became part of the spiritual DNA of Messenger. And uh, Jack wrote 50 books, 500 hymns. The the, um, chorus you probably know the most is Majesty. Worship His Majesty unto Jesus. Be all glory, power, and praise. That's Jack Hayford. Well, let me read something about him. He went to a church in 1969, and he said when he walked in the building, it was so oppressive and dark. This church had almost died, and there were only 20 people left. And uh, he wasn't sure what to do as a young pastor. Uh, He says the church had been one of the first four-square churches uh, there uh, in L.A., but by the late 60s, it was dwindling. It could only claim a regular attendance of 25 people. He said the place felt suffocating, and I wondered for a while if we had made a terrible mistake. 
And then God moved him to cleanse the church with praise. He says this, quote, as I walked through the sanctuary, he later recalled, I would be saying, praise your name, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. I would clap my hands out loud. I would say, praise your name, O Jesus. Hallelujah. And he would shout and sing and just walk through that place and walk around the building. I would literally sing the words, clapping my hands, and I was conscious of challenging something in the atmosphere of that place. Hayford did that for more than a year until one Sunday the church started to change and the spirit of the place felt different. You can't keep praising God in a place. You can't keep lifting up praises without seeing a shift in the atmosphere and a shift and a change in what was going, going on. Of course, we know the church went on to be, uh, I think they had 10,000 uh, people uh, by the time Hayford uh, resigned on a Sunday morning gathering. Uh, and that church became a powerful center for revival. Uh, Hayford's example to us is something that we need to really take note of because in the world that we live in, darkness can crowd in on us very quickly. And I feel like the Lord has been saying to me, you need to reignite this whole thing of worshiping me and praising me. And some of you that are coming from an evangelical background uh, that aren't used to praising God out loud, you need to learn to praise the Lord out loud. You need to learn to clap hands. And I, I have to admit, I've been driving Janice crazy. I've been blowing a shofar in my house. Debbie and Amanda, thank you for the shofar you gave me. Uh, Janice needs to talk to you about that. Uh, but anyway, I've been, I've been learning to play that shofar because the shofar is sounded to awaken the people of God. And folks, I have to tell you, we've gotten some amazing um, words from the Lord. One of them I sent out uh, today, uh, and uh, this is being recorded on Wednesday, but I sent it out and it's a dream from Janice Heidi about the people. She saw uh, part of the dream was a picture of beds in the sanctuary here at River of Life with people laying there sleeping. I don't wanna be a sleeping church. And I'm still praying about what the meaning of that is. All I know is it's time for the church to awake. It's not time for us to be asleep. And if you are feeling that heaviness or that darkness around you, we need to do the same thing that Jack Hayford did, whether it's in our house, whether it's in our business, even during the day. And people say, well, are you going to go around praising Jesus all the time? I hope that's what's going through my mind. And I have to tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to seed songs into my heart and mind and praise God more than I ever have. The Lord is telling me that's important in this season. Some of us talk about spiritual warfare. It's, there's a time to bind spiritual strongholds. There's a time to rebuke the enemy. But most good spiritual warfare is offensive spiritual warfare where we take the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit and move forward proclaiming the praises of God. When you sing, when you clap, when you shout, when you proclaim, there's a powerful release uh, that happens there. Uh, scripture tells us that uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15, um, <clears throat> And it also says the same, similar thing in Colossians, but I'll read this in Ephesians here. Pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. So we need to pay attention how we walk and what we do with our mind. He says, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to indiscretion reckless indiscretion. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And this is what God has called us to do. He says in verse 19, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. So at first he says, speak to one another in praises. In other words, let's do it outwardly. There's something, even when we gather, we're singing to the Lord, but we're also encouraging one another as we speak out praises. And then he says, sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. He's talking about our inner life, our thought life. How many of you are struggling with temptations or struggling with various things? Start filling your mind and your heart with praise and thanksgiving and see what happens. Verse 20, he says, always giving thanks to God the Father. The minute that we stop giving thanks, we start going over to the dark side. People that are ungrateful have given themselves over to the dark side. And when we 
start giving thanks to the Lord, what it does, it's like resetting our spiritual compass. It's opening a doorway to heaven. Remember what Psalm 100, which is a, a picture of how we come before the Lord. It says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. So God tells us very clearly how he wants us to come to him. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Psalms are all uh, the attitudes of praise that we see in the Psalms, uh, the 150 Psalms. Hymns are the same format as in Jesus' day. They are structured statements of proclamation, usually a lot of deep theology that we sing in proclamation to God. Spiritual songs are singing in the Holy Spirit, spontaneous songs. I loved last week when Brandon was leading worship. He went off the page. He ran out of the words and started singing the own words that were in his heart. And uh, when, when, we do, when our worship leaders do that, you just need to follow them and sing your own words. Uh, sing in the Spirit, meaning sing in uh, tongues if you have that gift. Uh, that's ac acceptable, but also singing in English as well. Attitudes of praise. Let me just finish with this, and I'm just going to go through this quickly, but I'll send this out so you can look at this in more uh, detail later. Uh, as we study the Old Testament in Hebrew, and especially the Psalms, we find seven different words that are translated praise. And I just want to go through this real quickly to give you an idea of how, how God wants us to be creative. The first word is barak, which means to bless, to kneel, or to salute. By implication, it means to uh, bless God by kneeling down and to thank Him. Uh, it's a uh, powerful word, and this is how we enter into the presence of God, by blessing Him and thanking Him. The second word is yada, and these are up on the screen here. Um, it means to revere or worship, to give thanks or praise with extended hands. And this word almost means there's a stretching out toward God, a yearning of our hearts and a stretching up toward Him by wringing the hands or reaching out to Him or lifting our hands. This is an attitude of praise that signifies a surrender to God, a desperation for God, and an openness of our hearts. This is the word, by the way, yada, that's used in Daniel chapter 9 and Nehemiah 1 when they talk about interceding for uh, the nation of Israel. So the third one is tauda. It means confession, praise, or thanksgiving. Uh, these are songs that are more of a liturgical worship, kind of a hymn or praise of confession. Sometimes when I feel like I need to prime my praise pump, so to speak, I'll go to the Psalms and I'll read them out loud and then I'll respond with my own words after I read David's words or Asaph's words. So uh, that's an important thing. The fourth is Zamar, which means to make music, to play a musical instrument, to pluck the string or to twang. Uh, to touch the strings of a musical instrument, literally, to give forth praise and sing forth praises or psalms. If you've got an instrument, use it for the Lord. Uh, number five is one of my favorites, halal. This is the root of hallelujah. So when we say hallelujah, we're saying halal to Yahweh. We're using part of God's name there, hallelujah to Him. This is right out of the... Um, uh, this is right out of the Greek, uh, or excuse me, Hebrew interlinear. It means to shine, to hence to make a show, to boast, to be clamorously foolish over, to rave, to celebrate, to stultify, to boast, to commend. And uh, this is an amazing word that means we should be crazy about worshiping God, to just lift up praises to Him, to boast about our Lord. So I want you to know that this week I've been doing this in our sanctuary. I've been walking around the church when no one else is here. And then Dion and I one day walked around just shouting to the Lord, proclaiming the goodness of the Lord, talking about God's goodness to us. Tehillah is the sixth one. It's a song or hymn of praise, a spontaneous expression of, of a spiritual song. Uh, this is also derived from halal. Number seven is shabak. It means to exclaim, to shout, to laud, to praise or commend. And I think shouting is very appropriate. Sometimes when we feel like things are closing in, we need to just shout uh, praises to the Lord, to address in a loud tone, commend, to give glory to God, to keep in praise. This is what the uh, commentaries say. The word for praise is often connected with the triumph of God's people over their enemies. And there's a time to shout to the Lord. 
So the Lord is telling us how he wants to come to him. He tells us psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. The reason I share that is sometimes I think we don't know exactly how to do that. Read the psalms. Clap your hands, all you people, Psalm 47. Shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph. Play upon the, music, uh, play upon the musical instruments. Bang a drum. Just get your housemate's permission. I told Janice I won't frighten her with the shofar. I'll let her know when I'm going to play that. And when the weather gets nicer, I'll play in the backyard. But here's the deal. We need to learn to grow in praise to God. I feel like the Lord is saying it's time to stretch your praise muscles and to learn to praise Him. Worship can have many attitudes. As you see in those seven words, there are times when it's warfare, times when there's adoration, just a quiet uh, meditation before the Lord, maybe listening, being still in His awe. Uh, there's also a time to shout, and there's, there's a time to rejoice. Taking joy again is what rejoice means, to take back the joy. And some of us need to do that right now. So let's take a moment and let's pray, and then I'll give you your instructions for House Church. Father, I just pray that you would stir up in us, that you would awaken in our hearts, God, a zeal and a joy and a desire to praise you. Lord, where we have allowed our hearts to become dull, where we have allowed darkness to creep in, I just pray that you would establish uh, us as centers of praise, that we, as we praise you, that we would actually create a touch point between heaven and earth. When we align our hearts by praising you, there's a power, an anointing that's poured out upon us. And God, I pray that you would just work in every home, in every house church, in our businesses, and every place that we go. Help us to be bearers of your presence and of your glory. And help us to cultivate that anointing and that manifest presence in our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here's your assignment. It's up on the screen there. Take a moment to have a spontaneous worship time. Uh, I've given you a couple things you can do. Shout of victory, reading scripture, giving thanks, waiting quietly in the awe of his presence. And if somebody has a song or a hymn or a spiritual song, let's just take time to uh, respond to the Lord. And we don't do enough of that spontaneously. Discussion, two questions. Have you ever had an experience as a presence of God bearer when praising changed the atmosphere or conditions around you? Share how that impacted you. And then what's the greatest thing that challenges you about this message and how are you going to allow it to be worked into your life? And pray for one another. God bless you.